Good afternoon, Click fans, and welcome back to wonderful Orlando, Florida. We're here coming into the afternoon of our power-packed coverage of Click Connect. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, joined by John Furrier. Yeah. John, we've had really cool and different yeah. afternoons today. We have all the answers here on theCUBE. That's going to be the focus of this seg segment. We have all the answers. That's <laughs> a, I, I am here for bold claims. That is a bold claim It's even not about the us. questions anymore. It's about the answers. The well, old we, days was, hey, ask good questions. That was the big data paradigm. Now we're in a whole nother generation. I'm so looking forward to this next segment. It's going to be awesome. Me too. Please welcome Brendan. Brendan, thank you so much for being here with us. Glad to be here. Y you happen to work in a department that I think is probably pretty popular right now. Yeah. AI and analytics. Yeah, this, it feels like this AI thing might stick around. It feels a little bit like the internet. Yeah, might, yeah it might, does. It might be, might be it around, does. I, I don't know, it's, it's pretty fun. It's exciting times. It is exciting times. Speaking of exciting times, rave reviews during that exciting keynote. Yeah. I have heard from so many people how excited they are, particularly for Click Answers. Give us a little recap of that, just in case folks didn't have a chance. So Click Answers is a generative AI assistant, right? So knowledge base and assistant, I should say, that business users can build and deploy themselves mm -hmm. off of unstructured data. And when you think of unstructured data, it's Word documents, call center notes, PowerPoints, PDFs, all the things. And there's a ton of information in there Yeah. that if you mine it, you're going to find some really interesting pieces of knowledge. So what are you anticipating? I know it comes out next month, right? Yes. So what are you anticipating? Because I'm sure you've had some good customer conversations. Yeah, we have. What do you think people are going to do with it? Where do you see some of the use cases going? Uh, it's interesting. We're um, we have our first customer actually. Um, that customer is called Click. Oh. We're going to use it ourselves. You're so drinking one, your own Kool-Aid. Absolutely. Love yeah. It. So we are um, we're looking to use it for our sales knowledge base, mm -hmm. right? And so what we did is we actually took all our marketing messaging all our sort of sales messaging that we do. We did this last Friday and we trained it in about 20 minutes with all of our content. So sales would be able to say, hey, That's it? Yeah, about 20 minutes. That's impressive, I yeah. just want to sit on that for a second. Because <laughs> yeah. I think when people think about training models, I mean, depending on how much data you have, we're talking yeah. about time. I yeah. mean, that's where all the compute is. So, so super fast. Yeah. And so sales is one, customer success is going to be another one, customer support. Um, we look at uh, marketing, so let's say you're going to do demand generation, you know, what should we be saying and, and what should we be talking about pro products about. Um, HR, right? my, my, my wife is an HR professional actually, and is a customer, oddly enough, but not yet of answers. Um, she's saying this would be great for our policy documentation. We could do absolutely everything. So the use cases are sort of unend unending. Mm -hmm. Generative AI is going to be a real boom for um, the adoption of better data management foundationally Completely. at many levels. So that's been a big story here and around the industry. Answers highlights that kind of uh, fascination, the appetite for generative AI capabilities is yep. high, so check there. But it's not easy. Can you share the end-to-end -end workflows of how this enables more accelerated adoption? Because you got the talent cloud, yep. and you got answers. Those two together yep. provide a design experience yep. for probably better adoption. Okay, and I'm sure you're probably counting on that, but walk us through the, what it is. This is going to be a short segment because it's so easy and simple actually. <laughs> What's the answer? So um, <laughs> there, there, are a couple, there are a couple sort of use cases that you can think about here, right? One is your average business user. They would literally go in, find their documents, say if it's on a OneDrive, on a Google Drive, whatever it is, select the documents, import, index, done. That's step there. But then there are some more complex cases, and I know you talked to Drew earlier, mm -hmm. right? So there are more complex cases where some of this unstructured data is a little bit all over the place. So it may require something like a talent cloud to go off and get it and manage it and make sure the quality's there, and then move it and get it into a format that answers can use. So there may be a case where it may get a little technical, but ultimately we want it to be really simple that anybody could use it, like even me. You know, one of the things I heard on the keynote, and again, you, I love to hear keynotes when you hear things like data supply chain, the word vector 12 times. <laughs> um, you know, we have new stuff emerging to help with retrieval and organization. Yep. You mentioned indexing. It's not as simple as saying index. It's, you guys make that easy for the user, but behind the scenes is vector databases, all new technologies. What are some of the highlights? Could you share? some of the underpinnings. So I'm going to say vector twice because I don't want to end on 13, let's go on 14, right? So vec obviously there's a vector database underneath and we're take yeah. using that rag-based um, architecture yeah. to go after it. But what we're really trying to do is 
I don't want to say obfuscate because that's a bit could be negative, but we we want it to be so that your average user doesn't need to worry about that because people to do it are hard to find, yeah. they're expensive, and also we don't want customers building it themselves because we don't want them to take on that cost, right? This is a cost effective and quick way for them to do it. You're also going to be able to combine this with Clicks Engine, right? Our, our analytics engine that does this with um, structured data. That's on the roadmap, not going to be there on version one. So all of the things that we have underlying have really set us up to be able to do this. It's really exciting. So it is very exciting. You have a lot of pieces of the puzzle. We've had a, we a few different partner conversations about that and even some of your team have been recruited because you have all the different pieces of the puzzle. I'm, I'm curious, so on our last segment, Mary was mentioning that Gen AI was the shot in the arm to AI to give us this, this, this supercharge that we're at now. You know, yep. AI's been around forever, here we are. I would imagine that innovating internally in the AI space right now has also gotten supercharged. So yes. how quickly, I know there was the acquisition, how quickly were you able to pull together the solution for your customers and, and how is that even going deeper? How has that affected your culture of innovation internally? So we did the acquisition earlier this year. Mm -hmm. We are releasing the product a short six months later. Which impressive. Is, yeah, being from Boston, Very I'd say impressive. it's wicked fast, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. really fast. But you say it's wicked fast. It's wicked fast, yeah. right? So it's it's really, really fast. We're getting out there quickly. Um, what, what I'm seeing in the R&D org that we have and what our customers should really think about is we are trying to innovate quickly and we're trying to fail fast, right? Because it's not all going to be the land of sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns, right? No. There will be some problems. We here. might want it to be all unicorns. We <laughs> might, might want <laughs> we, to be unicorns. As unicorn fans. <laughs> but it, 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 look, we were trying to fail fast. The other thing we're doing is we're actually working very closely. My design org is spending a lot of time with customers, leading with the design, so we know what the user experience is going to be like, and our product management team is heavily engaged there as well. So we're really using every pillar of good product development to try to get it right. right? That's what we're, what we're really doing. You know, the Kindy acquisition uh, was pretty smart because you know, Ryan and the team over there, they were on the front end of oh, yeah. the open AI kind of vibe. Yep. They've been obviously CUBE alumni many times. Mm -hmm. But what they nailed down, I thought was clever, was the reasoning aspect of it. And I think you mentioned that earlier about the vectors and the stuff going on. The other Click executive said on the CUBE, or, and the AI council was here, AI scales intellect. So Does. intelligence, the human in the loop, but also the reasoning and the data becomes a big part. Can you share your vision from a product standpoint, how data moves from being an ingredient to the product to actually being the product when you start adding in reinforced learning and reasoning, mm -hmm. metadata reasoning, all so kinds that, of innovations. What's your thoughts there? It, one of my, I, 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 you probably heard that Drew and I have been at this for decades. <laughs> I wish he hadn't mentioned that, <laughs> but he, here we are. I mean, you boys started as five-year-olds in the playground. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, so, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Um, so, one of the things that over my career that has sort of driven me nuts is where everybody says, we need to be data-driven. You don't need to be data-driven, you need to be data-centric, right? And so if you think about what Drew is talking about today and what this means for generative AI, you've got to put this data at the center of everything you do, right? Um, and it's, it's generating more. So from a product's perspective, what I really see us evolving to is delivering on our vision of both structured and unstructured data, mm -hmm. combining that to help people make better decisions constantly so that they're not just saying, oh, let me go do an analysis with my columnar data, and then let me go do some generative AI, but make it, the, make it one single way of thinking about it. And I think, I go back to my daughter, right? My 22-year-old, who really has just said, um, Dad, I don't want to go to a dashboard. I actually want to talk to something and have it natural language. spit back yeah. the data and natural language. Trusted data. And trusted yes. data. Oh, it's even more important because she's a nurse. Yeah. So it's got to be super trusted, yeah. right? I mean, that's oh, a really interesting. I mean, yeah. it's matter of life or death. Matter of life and death, yeah. yeah. So we really see those things coming together and we see it, the whole vision that we have around AI is yeah. starts with the data. Drew's in the data view is a big part of getting that data, yeah. structuring the data, prepping it, and then applying the appropriate appropriate AI technique, because right now, mm -hmm. it feels like when people say AI, it feels like 1997 again, when people say, I'm on the internet. And you yeah. say, well, what do you mean by you're on the internet? Oh, I use AOL. Yeah, okay, that's not the internet, that's AOL. It's a proprietary people, walled garden. People are now, <laughs> what's interesting is people are saying that, right? Yeah, yeah, people yeah. are saying, 
it's AI and you ask them, they really mean gen AI. So we see it applying the right techniques. I, I, yeah. Right. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that's a really astute observation. And it's a little bit like, and if you ever saw Fort Landing, it's like, put a bird on it. There's, there's very much that, like, put a gen AI on it. Yep. And then something nice will happen, maybe. Well, I heard, I was at a, I was at an industry event recently and what I actually heard a conversation about was someone was, a vendor was saying to one of their prospects or customers, the best use case for generative AI is complex data analysis. After I stood up, picked myself up off the ground, it made me realize that people really don't know what to do with this yet. Yeah. And it, it, it yeah. does start with the data. You're right. Yeah, you know, I think that you bring up a good point. This came up in the AI council too while you were mm -hmm. out on the floor talking to customers. The, if something happened, I don't think users would know what to do with it. In other words, there's the point of saying, we had a, we have a conversation, if I own my own data, what do I do with it? Like that's, that application is coming, but it has to be expected and understood. And so you start to get into this, this um, innovation cycle where it's like, okay, you got a net new capability, but do we even know what it means, the impact? So you have to kind of create a user expectation. Completely. And so you have to have the experience first, yep. then expectation grows. So you guys are in the middle of that right now. We going are. from data science dashboards to, wow, this is now native to every application. Yep. So it's not just an analytics category, it's everything. It's, it's like everything. observability, you got to have it in the app software. Uh, and, and coming back to your point about data again, right, the, the interesting thing is, I always encourage people to ask, to, to go to Google and just do this. AI fails. And just oh, yeah. have a quick search. Because <coughs> when you get it wrong, you are a news story. It's, you become an instant news story. Yeah. So to your point, as you go get the data, yeah. making sure it's accurate, starting with that, like it's the story with my golf, I was the bad input, right? So you get bad data. Yeah. When you get it to the models and embed it in an application where someone is making a mm -hmm. life or death decision, how do we know it's right? And with generative AI, who knows? Like who knows where the story came from? And that's one of the things about answers. You're going to be able to see what the source was for you to be able to answer the question. So I got to ask you, because the, the enterprise matters. and consumer markets and the internet, you bring that up earlier, so yeah. the consumer side went faster, the home yep. runs were hit early, and then the enterprise was more small ball game. Same thing kind of happening now, and that's why the retrieval augmentation generation is hot, because users can play with their data, their existing data. So, yep. so the question to you is this, do you agree that the end-to-end -end workflows and the data is the new intellectual property? And if so, how are companies using those because if an application, say a banking app or whatever, yep. is already out there, SaaS is SaaS, yep. but not Gen AI enabled. What's the changeover required to make that a generative AI app? Because oh if you boy. know the workload, yep. end to end, you can scope it, you can get the capabilities, and then you say, okay, how, where's the data layer fit in there? So the question to you is, do you believe that thesis? And then two, how do you upgrade a SaaS app to generative AI, and what changes in the data? I would say, I always go from business back to technology, right? Risk. It's all about risk, right? And that's why I encourage people to look up AI fails, because it's risk. So you start, you start by looking at that risk, and then you also look at where can we bring generative AI in where it's minimal risk. You just, you just spoke to Harman, for example. They have mm -hmm. a, an amazing view on it, right? They have a three-tiered model of there's human touched, right? There's human in the loop-ish, as he describes it, and then there's absolutely not, this is not going through generative AI. So you really want to tier it and look at what is the risk to your business. Starting internally is always going to be safer than putting it out on a website and some customer-facing app, but tier it out, start internally, and then try it's to- product management, risk, risk management and product management, the nexus of those two. Completely. And the data is the product. <laughs> the data is the product. I mean, you product. guys are using terms like data supply chain, data observability. I mean, this sounds like yeah. a cloud conversation to me. Like, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not cloud native. We're not talking about microservices and Kubernetes. We're talking about data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Data is now becoming a programmatic element of software. And it's, it, and it's funny you describe yeah. it like that. It's because, Drew, I bring up our mm -hmm. relationship again. We treated data as a product like that yeah. back in the early 2000s because yeah. we knew that there was value in that. And if you treat it like a first class citizen, yeah. all of your outcomes and all your analytics you apply to get your outcomes, they're just going to be that much more effective and better. That paid off. 
that was yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And here we are on main stage Jones together, right? True, and you you and True both have the same comment, it almost and the same kind of vibe, almost like this is the moment it's happening now, finally. Yeah. And what I mean by that mm -hmm. is, remember the Hadoop days back you know, when we started the Cube, about 14 years ago. It was Cloudera, Hortonworks, yep. Cloudera, then Hortonworks, Hadoop. Yep. That kind of fell to the sidelines, and then Spark came in, now the data lake. So we've been on this waiting moment. Generative AI and the compute and all the capabilities, just the perfect storm right now. How would you describe that as, as being that patient uh, person in the industry saying, finally, okay, this is the glimpse of the future. The script has flipped. How would you describe it? Um, in the data business, why is it now? What, what is the main? It, it, is, it, it is interesting, having been in the space for a while, everyone said when self-service BI came out, that was the quote, democratization of data, yeah. right? Gen AI is actually going to be the democratization of all of this, right? Because it makes it more accessible to everybody. And it, it's actually starting as a consumer experience, and as I said in the keynote this morning, these digital natives, they're not going to want some different experience at work. They're going to want to yeah. say, wait a minute, yeah. I, use Gen, I use Gen AI to cheat on my math test or cheat on my English, oh, I mean, sorry, help Augment. me, help me. Assist, <laughs> assist my assist, homework. Assist my yeah. homework, right? <laughs> I used yeah. it, but they're going to want that yeah. at the workplace, and if we do this right, and more importantly, when we do it right, and you've already seen some of the things yeah. we're doing, that will be the great equalizer. It'll make it, it'll make it so that, that BI and analytics and data discovery isn't a thing, it's part of everything. So you're you saying do. that the, the innovator, innovation about this trend is that you get faster results from a, at a user level in a new format. Is that kind of what yeah. you're, you're, I think that's what it, I hear it, you saying. It's, it's a more, it reaches everyone. And, yeah. and everyone can play with that data, yeah. I think is really what you're getting at. Yep, yeah. my, my daughter uses yeah. her. Hey Siri, um, hey Q. Her, her hey, junior click. copywriter, <laughs> she calls it, right? So, yeah. yeah, she uses that. It's but that I believe that the consumer experience is going to force yeah. the enterprises to change. I, I think I think that is an interesting and very cool shift we're seeing right now. And I think it's you're fun. absolutely right. It's it's sort of cool. The demand and the consumer space moves fast. I mean, people want to people want to play. Yeah, people want to play, and it is moving so quickly right now that um, enterprises are going to have a hard time keeping up. They just are. Yeah. They definitely are. You talked about it a little bit, but I like that we had you, you a 17 year old as well, correct? Yeah. And they were both watching you up there today? Yeah, they were. They very were. cool, very special. What do you hope that Gen AI or AI, doesn't matter, does for your kids' generation that it hasn't, that it may not be able to do for us? <laughs> It doesn't need to be morose, but you know what I mean. What do you hope it does for so, the future? So the digital natives versus the analog yes. natives. Yeah, okay, yeah, got yeah. it. Um, what I hope it does is I hope it makes them smarter, right? Mm. And yeah. so there's a lot of philosophy, there are a lot of people out there say, oh my gosh, AI is going to re replace humans. I actually see it making them smarter, right? And the, and the ones that are embracing it and understanding that, there's a reason that they're called AI assistants, is they're there to help you be smarter. So that's, my hope is it will be part of everything they do, and they'll be the smartest generation, sort of like one of our generations called the greatest generation. Yeah. Maybe they'll be the smartest generation. We're just not called any of those things, are we? We've got the greatest, we'll have the smartest. We're, we're Gen X, <laughs> right? We're in, we're in between the millennials and the boomers. We didn't have right? helmets when we rode our bikes. Yeah, right? exactly, look, right? look at us now. Wait, was did you, did, and you, please tell me you drank out of a hose growing yeah. up. Yeah, right, exactly, right? So. I jumped off a ramp with my friends were the cars. That's great. I'm fortunate I saw my front teeth after a lot of incidents as a child. All right, last question for you, because I feel like we could go down quite a few rabbit holes from that particular That could have been pretty bad. Yeah, they could have <laughs> Could have gotten wild there for a second. When we have you on the show at Next Click Connect, what do you hope to be able to say, and I'm not going to let you say that you have uh, customers using it at scale because that's too easy of an answer. What do you hope to be able to say next year that you can't yet say today? Wow, wasn't expecting that. That's a good one. I, was, I got to give you some of a curveball. You were looking a little too casual and no. comfortable up there. I got to share some product roadmap information. It's okay. Um, <laughs> or you could say you, you know, you hope that your daughter saved a bunch of lives. I don't know. It could be anything. What I'm, what I, what I'm hoping to be able to say next year is it really is about the structured and unstructured data together, right? And being able to help people really get the most out of that and make different decisions differently. Yeah. That's what I want to see. Um, and yes, ultimately, I would like to see my daughter as a customer eventually, right? Yeah. So that would be a little bit of a 
a little bit of an aspirational hope because she's <laughs> just graduated from college. But <laughs> congratulations! Yeah, thank you. Appreciate sure. that. That is so awesome. Well, this has been thrilling. I hope you're able to say all those things when we have you on the show next year. And <laughs> thank you, John, as always, for for chiming yeah. in. And I'm glad, despite not having helmets, that we're all sane enough to sit yeah. here and share <laughs> this wonderful message with each and every one of you watching our fabulous coverage here at Click Connect in Orlando, Florida. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching the Cube, the leading source for enterprise tech news.